Today, we have a really unique guest. We all know, or we should know, that there's four kinds of capital in a family, financial, social, human, and intellectual, but there's also a fifth, spiritual. And I was casting about to find someone to deeply explore this topic, and of course, I found the perfect guest in Jonathan Peugeot. I had listened to his great online explication of the movie Spirited Away, which I highly recommend, and some excellent conversations he had had with John Verveke and Jordan Peterson. Jonathan runs a popular YouTube channel called The Symbolic World, where he explores the symbolic patterns that underlie our experience. He is also an Orthodox Christian stone carver and deeply understands the cosmology of religion. But this podcast will resonate no matter what your denomination or believer status, as Jonathan is talking about how we represent our deeper desires through symbols, where money fits into all of this, and how it can help us understand the world around us. We talk about how money should be thought of as pure potential, how borrowing accelerates time and pulls from the future. We also discuss how you can get stuck worshiping the potential of money and forget your more important goals in life. Join me for an absolutely fascinating conversation with Jonathan Peugeot. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Anything said by the guests or hosts should not be construed as legal or investment advice. Thanks for listening. I figured I'd go right to the source. And, <laughs> and because you have a, an understanding of the symbolic and the spiritual world, now you didn't go to divinity school or anything like that. This is, these no. are things that you've learned yeah. uh, over the years. Yeah, I did. I studied, I studied some theology when I was approaching orthodoxy. I went to, I did, I guess a year's worth maybe. But I was going to move to, I was getting ready to move to Africa. So that kind of went to the side, but it was mostly my own reading and my brother. I don't know if you saw, I did some talks with my brother and yes, Matthew. Yeah. He's really a genius, really. A lot of my ideas come from my discussions with him and we come from it on two different sides. He's mm -hmm. been, he has a strange story where when he was about 16, he decided that if he was going to be a Christian, he was going to read the Bible in the original language. And so at 16, he learned Hebrew on his own. And then he started reading the Bible in Hebrew. And that led him down a whole path of reading rabbinical commentary and getting involved in in that, let's say, strain of things. And I was more reading the church fathers and reading kind of Christian mystical thought. And so we would have these discussions where we're just trying to connect everything together. And so it, that's what a lot of this comes out of those discussions. Where do you think money fits into the symbolic world? Money, there are different aspects about money. Money is potential, mostly. Right. And it's a... It, that's the same with a lot of the, let's say the, the basic idea of, of the, of a coin. You have to think of it in terms of, there are two aspects to money. There's a potential aspect and there's also an order aspect. So there, there's both. Money is a, is potentiality. And so it's something which exists underneath actual, let's say transactions and it has to be actualized into something. And so you have, so it's, that's also why it's, it's become, especially now it's become more, it's actually more of a promise, right? That, that's what money is. It's like a promise of something. It's not, doesn't have value. It only has value in time. So it's a, and so because of that, it also has this notion that it's this kind of potentiality that will be actualized at some future point. And it, it seems also that's what's, been taken advantage of right now in terms of the, let's say the deconnection between money and, uh, and reserves where money has become pure speculation and pure promise. It, it's all credit. And so that has, it, so it's it, it becoming more and more potentiality in a way. There is another aspect about money, which is the idea of the, uh, the stamp. And so if you think of a, a traditional coin, you need a guarantee of the quantity of its potential, right? You need something which guarantees the value of the coin. Because the problem with potentiality itself is that it's it's chaos. And so it doesn't have a, it doesn't have, it doesn't have form. It's just, it's unlimited. It's limited. You don't know because it's a question mark basically. But the, what happens with the stamp, let's say the image of the king on the coin, what it does is it gives it enough limit so that it's a clear, value. It's, it has a clear value. It's not just unlimited potential or let's say not unlimited, but let's say it's unspecified potential. So it's not unspecified potential anymore. It has a stamp which says this, I guarantee I'm the king. I guarantee that this coin is really this amount of gold or this weight of whatever precious metal. 
And so that limits the, it gives enough form to the potential so that you can then use it in transactions. And so it's the same with money today. Now it's, it's become even more. It's like, well, you have a bill and there's a stamp of a number on it. And all of a sudden that bill has this value because there's a stamp of a number on it. I mean, uh, we're a long ways from, uh, let's say, guaranteeing the weight and the measure of a coin. Now it's really just, it just, it really is just like a fiat. It's almost like fiat order and uh, let's say boundless potential or like a very uh, unmoored potential, you could say. Does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. And it also, it, it reminds me of the church for many years banned usury. Yep. Because the idea was that you can't have something that reproduces itself. Yep. It's um, a monster. What, it's become a mo money right now is definitely a monster. It has that, that because it, it, it's not only what money is doing is it's accelerating time too. Right now, the credit accelerates time because hmm. what happens is you, this is really hard to think about. I've been trying to think about this for years. <laughs> I, what does credit mean exactly? And so you're basically calling the future, right? You borrow, you don't have something. You don't, you won't, you don't have a car, right? And so you borrow from the future, right? You're like, I'm going to take this from the future. It's not there yet. It's just in potentiality. I'm going to take it from the future. I'm going to actualize it today. And then what I'm doing is I am, it's like, I'm leaving this hole in the future that I then have to fill. Okay. And so that is, that's problematic. It's a problematic thing to do because what it ends up doing is it will accelerate time. It'll, cause you're actually pulling the future in, into the present constantly. You're pulling it faster and faster, especially cause you, th the system that we have now, it's a weird cycle where, because it's only credit, right? That cycle has to constantly increase your, whatever the banks borrow from the central bank, they have a, they borrow it with a small, small percentage of interest that they have to pay back, but that interest doesn't exist. It's what is it like? It does, and so it's a projection into the future. You have to pay back with that interest, but then to do that, you also end up having to borrow more. And so it's like this weird cycle that is accelerating time. And so the problem also, the problem with user in the sense of, of credit with interest is that it becomes a beast that's out of control. You can't stop it. Like you couldn't stop it anymore. If you did that, the whole thing would collapse. I think that does to the person spiritually. What do you think is going on there? I think it's definitely in terms of the idea of, let's say, in terms of Christian morality or in terms of a Christian way of seeing is that you have your passions, right? And so your passions are this unlimited capacity to desire. So you have an unlimited capacity to desire things. And what credit has done is it's the opposite of sacrifice. Credit is the opposite of sacrifice. So right. Jordan talks about you sacrifice the present for the future, right? So you go to school, you do all the things that you don't like to do so that then your future will be brighter. Credit is the opposite. Credit is you sacrifice the future for the present. And so in a way, it's it really is like a sin. Like it is, a, it is at its base a sin. I say that. I borrowed to, to buy my house. Obviously, I borrow money like everybody else, but creates, it's part of a whole mesh of things which create a society which is focused on their passions. And so and it's interesting if you look at the effect, you could just look at the effect that credit has on lower class people you, because you see the lower class people, the type of person that will really, will become alcoholic or will become, will let their lives become unmoored. That the type of person that in the a thousand years ago would have been serfs, let's say, and the king would have managed their lives for them, basically, and you can see what it does. It just destroys people. People live, they live with their credit cards maxed out with their, and they live at this crazy level of, it's like they, they're not will they can't think out the future. And so they're constantly willing to sacrifice their, their future for the present. That reminds me, there's that book by that guy, Mendel Lathan. It was called Scarcity. He studied people who were on limited budgets, poor, and he noticed what it did to their sense of time. Your yeah. sense of time gets compressed and compressed yeah. until you basically end up thinking about how am I going to get through the next day? Yeah. And what that means is you can't plan long term. You can't buy in bulk. You can't think out how am I going to pay back this house, this car, or even my clothes. And so eventually what you do is you basically, you give up, you become overwhelmed by your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's also part of this idea when you talk about compressing time, it's part of that idea that I mentioned that in general, credit accelerates time. And I think that's part of also the 
machine, let's say the whole world is accelerating. Obviously, it's not, a, it's not something strange to say, but part of that has been the capacity of governments to, um, to borrow. And I don't know when, I never don't really understand it. Like I never totally understood what that means. Like, who exactly are they borrowing from? Like, how does it work? You know, who it's like when they say like the Canada has so many trillions of debt is to who do they owe this money to? They owe it to themselves in the future. So they're borrowing from themselves and then they have these whatever bonds or whatever. And so I don't totally understand it. But one thing I do know is that I can see that this process has been part of this acceleration of time because you're constantly borrowing from the future and you have to do it more and more so that you can maintain the the appearance let's say and then but then what do you do when the interest rate becomes so much i guess that's the problem people are wondering how that's going to happen what happens when the interest you have to pay on what you borrowed is so much that you can barely borrow enough just to pay the interest like that the whole system at some point has to somehow I guess you have a war. Oh, no, I was thinking more about the when you're talking about the symbolic world itself and how people develop an identity. Yeah. Um, and also, I, was, I used to think that Jordan has this little pocket cosmology where you have the known and you have the unknown yeah. and you have the knower. And there's two sides to each of them, a positive and a negative. And if you fall into chaos, then you're motivated by anxiety. Yeah. And if you voluntarily go into chaos, you're motivated by potential. But what's interesting is that money can take on both of those roles. Oh, yeah. Money definitely. can be a source of anxiety and money can confuse you or chameleon like take over that sense of potential so that instead of chasing the goal you should be chasing, you start instead chasing the money. And right. You course, start protecting you your to, to try to making sure that you have more and more or that you also don't lose it because that must be one of the most difficult things too, is that I lived in Africa for seven years. And so I felt I was, I've never been rich, but when you're in, when you're living, when I live in Kinshasa, you know, you're rich, obviously just because you're white and you're there. And so it was interesting to realize just how suspicious you end up being of everyone just because right. you get burned a few times where you realize that this person who's interacting with me, all they want is to get something from me. It might also be, it might, that, that might also be part of this idea of the unmooring of money, how money has become just basically this strange, unlimited potential it, it, because it's not connected to physical objects anymore as much. But if you think of, if you think of the aristocracy of the European aristocracy, although they did finally find their maker in the 19th century or they, 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 they end of the 18th century, they lasted for quite a while. And, and I'm wondering if the fact that their wealth was tied to land, they actually had to, they actually had to manage their land. Like the sons of the aristocrat had to learn to deal with his peasants, had to learn to make sure that the land was producing enough to sustain him. And he had to fight physically, had to go and fight to preserve his land. I wonder if that was not something that helped preserve wealth over at least a few centuries or something. What's interesting about the English aristocracy and the French aristocracy specifically is that, number one, it was tied to the land, but number two, they had primogenitor, which meant the firstborn son got everything. Right. And everybody else had to go out and usually either join the military or become a priest, actually. It's interesting. The kids, the second and third and onward, had to go fend for themselves, and the daughters were expected to marry into another wealthy family. And so this is an incredibly good way to preserve capital because, because the biggest problem with family fortunes nowadays and why they don't last is they get broken up very quickly. Exactly. Because by the time you're at the third generation, you're talking about 30, 40 people. And not all of them are getting the same amount of money. Not all of them are, the second generation maybe hasn't managed the money particularly well. They often don't. And every time you pass it along, you have to pay taxes on it. So the money dissipates. It's very hard to keep money, even substantial fortunes over time. They fall apart. Huh. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. I'm wondering, are there, have you been able to find some family that have been able to preserve their money for like the past 100 years or 200 years? Are there families that there are, are able to do that? There are. There's, with mixed success, the Rockefellers are obviously the ones that have done the best. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of interesting things about that fortune, though. One of them, it was the most substantial fortune of all time. His total fortune, I think, <laughs> is four. It's incredible. It's four or five times what Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have combined. 
Really? Yeah. It, I don't know. It'd be something like $400 billion today. It's a massive goodness. amount of money. The second thing was, is that he trained all his children at a very well at a young age to respect money. So he mm -hmm. gave them allowance. He made them do chores. He made them tithe from a very early age. Mm -hmm. And he himself was not profligate. He didn't spend a lot of it on silly things. He didn't drink. He didn't gamble. And he also had some people who were wor working with him who were really inspired and said, listen, this money is just going to flatten you and your family unless you start to find constructive ways to give it away. So they put it into lots of institutions. So the University of Chicago, Rockefeller University, there's all these museums and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. But they also managed the family's own money very well. And what they did was they tried to keep it together for as long as they could. Mm -hmm. People get money, they start to lose their sense of proportion. They lose touch with, with reality. But also, I thought it was interesting, I was thinking about things like Spirited Away, where you lose the ability to even develop your sense of identity. Yeah. She had to go through hardships in order yeah. to figure out who she was. This is something that's important, I think, in terms of, let's say, Western history and understanding the, uh, we talk about credit. I think credit is one of the biggest things to understand. I haven't totally mastered it, let's say, in terms of symbolism, but it seems like in terms of the setup of Europe, it made sense that that credit came from the foreigner there was something about that that made sense like the idea that christians let's say within the within themselves they're not they weren't allowed to lend themselves with credit and jews within the within amongst themselves they weren't allowed to lend with with interest but uh, if you borrow from the if you borrow with interest from the foreigner it shows you actually what that thing is because it's it's because you're basically borrowing from the future you're borrowing from the margin it's like there's a it the way you're doing it matches the geographical or identitarian problem is that if you borrow too much from someone that is not you you give you give them power right you give you're giving them power over you and so it's showing you what that's what that's doing. So it'll always mm -hmm. limit the amount that you're going to borrow because as you're borrowing from the outside, you're giving power to something that is not you, that is outside of you. And it's and it's and it is going to be this this thing that's going to grow. And then at some point is it's going to appear as a as like a as something that towers over you. And so I think that doing that, like doing it that way, gave access that they obviously it had huge problems. There was huge problem in terms of the actual way it ended up working out and Jews getting, usually getting the lower end of that. But in terms of symbolic structure, the idea of something coming from the outside, that's what it is. That's what we're doing when we're borrowing with interest. Now, because it's unmoored, it's like this monster is just grow growing and growing and it's looming over us. And like you said, the banks should have fallen, but we're not letting them. We're continuing to make them survive almost in this like zombie state where it's like keep coming, but we don't know what to do. And at some point there, it can't go on forever. Like it, when like when there's good, there has to be some kind of cataclysm. Like you said, it could be a war. Or it could be some kind of weird reset where for sure some countries are going to get the lower end of it and people are going to starve in some places. But it can't, it seems like it can't go on forever. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, it absolutely does. You know, what I wanted to ask you too is, obviously in, in the Bible, there's constantly, the, there's warnings about trying to serve God and mammon at the same right. time. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. I think that if you want, I think that if you want to know what, we're lucky because we've had the last few hundred years where people have decided to serve mammon. And so we can see what it does. We can actually, we actually have a, we have a case study of what it does if you do the opposite of what Jesus said. And so what it does is it, it creates a society that is, that has a lot of physical possibility, that has a lot of capacity for enjoyment, physical leisure, all those things are there. But then people, was it like, half of all women are on antidepressants and one third of all kids are on pros are on some kind of medication and and people are profoundly unhappy and also profoundly disconnected to, to each other because that's also one of the things that happens when you have money is that you don't have to rely on the people that are around you and so we have these sprawling suburbs where everybody is independent and nobody has to help each other 
And so because of that, nobody knows each other. And it's just a, it's just an actual, it, that's just an actual reality. That's not the only thing feeding, feeding that dynamic, but it is part of it for sure. And I don't know. Yeah, I don't know because we all we're all in it. It's almost impossible not to live inside inside that world. But I think that we have a case study. And also we've seen how people are just aren't religious anymore. They just aren't. They there are some people who are still vaguely religious or are surface religious. And, and there are a few people who are more authentically. But in general, society itself has become secular um, and by secular. It's like Sam Harris isn't getting his wish. It's not going to happen. People aren't going to be secular and become kind and uh, and caring about the world and all this. No, it's maybe a few people are, but most people just want the latest thing and they just want a big house and go to Cuba for in Canada, go to Cuba <laughs> for vacation, go on their on their two weeks fully paid with hotels with 10,000 rooms. And that's what they want. And that's what they'll do. And no matter how much we can have a few people thinking that secularism will create this utopia, it's like, Steve, you know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> the same thing with the environment, like the whole environment thing is related to that. It's the same. The environmental question is also this, I, it, this idea of borrowing from the future. We're doing the same thing with, uh, with the environment. We're not calculating we're borrowing from the future in order to be able to get what we want now. And so we're, we're not calculating in a normal way. We're, we're, we're basically just taking the resources so that we can do it now and not thinking about what are the consequences that are later. And that, people go ahead. Sorry. And people have their little, they put on little band-aids, they recycle. I just find recycling is one of the funniest things that the world has ever come up with. It's like a, it's like a little band-aid for people to think that they're not creating massive like tons and tons and tons of garbage but they are there still are because no one's actually recycling that stuff it's just piling up somewhere i don't know where they're piling it up but if you if you look at that you can see what our world is and i'm not even necessarily thinking about it in terms of ecological collapse or whatever but just in terms of noticing how much garbage we're producing if you want to see what a society looks like <laughs> how much of this stuff is coming out of us it's like we're oozing this filth and it's just oozing out of us anyways sorry like the stink spirit <laughs> yeah yeah something like that <laughs> the, accumulated all this filth yeah exactly you know, a nice baptism it reminds me a little bit of what you've said about you had a call with jordan where you talked you guys talked about exile that the mm -hmm. person in exile it's like a form of chaos because you've been you've either you've been cast out or you've cast yourself out. You've lost touch with, I don't know if it's who you are, or you've lost touch with what God is. Yeah. I want, is that a similar experience? Does that make sense? I think so. I think that definitely we are in exile. That is, that's pretty sure. In terms of a lot of things, the, uh, the scientific, even the scientific point of view is a form of exile because it's taking, it's looking at the world from the outside. And in, and in exile, that's where you get riches. It's just, that's what happens in the Bible. Really? Yeah. Well, that's because the Israelites go to Egypt and then they become wealthy. That's how it is. And they take all the gold and they take all the, and they also arrive being like basically 12 people, but I think they had their families too, but let's say a hundred people and they leave a million people. And so going into exile is going into physicality and then taking, acquiring body, you could say. And that's what exile always is. And so... Wait, you're acquiring the body? Yeah, especially exile into Egypt. It's a exile, exile is exile into the body. It's exile, let's say, out of the spirit and into the body. But the thing about the body is that it's both death, it's death, but it's quantity. Those two things are related. And so it's like you're moving away from quality, let's say, Imagine the temple. So imagine the temple is a good way to think of it. So you have the temple, you have the Ark of the Covenant in the middle, and then only the priest can go there. And then outside of that, you have the holy place, and then only the priests can go there, the other priests. And then you have the outer court, and then the outer court, then all the Israelites who are pure could go there. And then let's say in Herod's temple, you would have other courts where it's like the women, and then you have an outer court where even foreigners could come, and uh, even those that are not so pure could come. And so you're moving out towards the foreigner, you're moving out towards quantity as well. And so 
when you go into exile, you're also going to get to get gold. And that's why you that's why the gold is in a cave. That's why the gold is guarded by a dragon. That's why the gold is on the is down in the earth. It's down into the uh, to the deep. And so you go down in so Christ let's say goes down into to death, right? And then he glorifies the body. His body is resurrected in a higher in a more complete way let's say that's the positive possibility of going into exile so when you so that's the idea of going into exile is going into potential jordan says it all the time you got into chaos you got into potential but you can when if you go through that you can come out with more body and sometimes you have to do that you have to go and get some body like you need some some so but it it's not in, just in terms of normal reality it's not if you're if you're if your kingdom lacks wealth, what do you do? You invade another kingdom and you right. get wealth there. You get it from the outside. You, that's the that's how you get wealth is you go. It doesn't have to be seen as invading, but you go get wealth. When you're lacking in body, you have to augment your body. You have to augment in order to get wealth. And so our world has moved out into that, into the, in, we've actually moved out into the to the periphery. We moved out into exile. So all we have left is body. All we have left is rich and big house and technology and all of this. But there's no spirit is diminishing. Let's say. But I think that the concept of idolatry plays into that because the idea is that it's a having your cake and eat it too. You get the best of both worlds. You get to to worship what you get to embody the spirit in gold in a gold yeah. icon say, so to speak like, like a goat but and you think you're worshiping the god but you're not you're still outside of it one of the, the thing about let's say in terms of in ter- idolatry in terms of in the bible yeah. and in terms of the notion of idolatry itself because what happens what happens when you turn around okay so you say you're oriented towards god let's say okay right. and so it is possible to go to Egypt, think of Joseph. Joseph is the one, and Christ is also. Joseph goes to Egypt. He becomes rich, super rich, like the most rich, the richest person in the whole kingdom, basically. But he is capable to do that and remember God. So it, it's not impossible. Right. So Joseph goes to Egypt, he goes outside, he goes to the foreigner, he goes into exile, all those things. He gains wealth and he's able to remember God. There's memory with this, with where he's from. Okay. And so it's, it is possible to do that. But <laughs> when you move, what happens is as you move out into the outside, as you're moving out, the danger is that you forget where you're from. You forget your origin. And so what you turn around, so instead of let's say being oriented towards the center and moving out, you actually turn and you start to be oriented towards what's outside. And so then that's why idols in the Bible come from the foreigner. It's all of that is related. And so you, instead of looking towards where you're from, you start looking towards what's outside. And then your tendency to create centers, to create points of focus will now become perverted. So you'll You'll focus on something that is outside and you'll make that into the highest value. And that's what an idol is. An idol is something right. that because you're not remembering God, you're making something into God, into the new thing. And so it doesn't have to be money. Any, anything can do, like anything will do. When you become an alcoholic, that's what happens. It's like you, you think that alcohol is the highest thing and you think that thing, alcohol will bring you all you need will be the source of your need, right? Maybe you can do it with sex, you can do it with money. And money is the same thing, is that money becomes an idol because you att- you think that it's out, it's from money that you will get what you need. Whereas you're forgetting that it's from God that you get what you need. And that even if you do have money, that it's still from God that you'll get the things that you really need. And so uh, that's why the idea of you serve mammon, right? You serve money it that's the idea of serving it's that's one of the important things when you serve the highest thing so when christ says talks about mammon he, that's why the idea of serving idols serving mammon but also the same problem with becoming a slave to the foreigner is the same problem and so becoming a slave to a foreign king 
all those things, all those images are the same in terms of serving the, the, that which is not your center, your heart, your identity, let's say. So you have to serve your own center, but you also have to be facing in the right direction, correct? You have to be facing towards God. That would be well, like, in a way that your center is God, really. In, okay, I mean, okay. In a sense. I'm thinking inside, outside. I'm getting confused. Right, but yeah, it, yeah. It, it, there's an analogy between the, there's an analogy between, let's say, the divine spark in your heart and the Holy of Holies in the temple. All those things are analogical. Let's say what's in the temple, God manifesting himself in the temple is analogical on a social scale to you finding the divine spark that is inside you, Christ in you, like Paul would say. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And that is this idea that we all, everything has, the, every, everything can be a way to come to the highest thing because all the center of everything is divinity, is the divine spark. And even, and even, even wealth, all that. But the problem is when you're looking out you're looking at the thing itself and not looking to where it points to, where it leads, let's say. That, it, that could be, it, it's like that for everything. It's like that for everything in life is that if you take something and you see it as independent from its origin, then that's how it becomes an idol. Because you're seeing it as, you think that it has existence in itself and it doesn't. It is, it's linked in a hierarchy. Everything is linked in a hierarchy towards the divine. You said something, I think you said once, the king on his throne is useless. It's the hierarchy that gives him the power. Of course, yeah. But he would have to be aligned with that. Correct? Right. Yeah. He would, the idea would be, like the traditional way to see it would be like, the king receives his authority, his power, let's say, his kingly power, receives it from, a God, from God through a bishop or through, through, through the pope or whatever. And then that, and so the, the king, he's looking towards God and then because of that, he can rule the people and the people look towards the king. And then they also look towards God. And it's the wife looks to her husband, but also looks to the king and looks towards God. The children look to their parents. So it's like there's this natural hierarchy which kind of points towards the divine. That's That, that would be like the normal way for things to function. But that's if, the I mean, proper authority. That's, that's yeah, the way exactly. it's supposed to be. But like you said. But it's easy enough king, to just start worshiping him. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, you or can do that. Right. You can worship the king as being on itself. But now we're actually, we've actually so upside down that we're we <laughs> not only are we worshiping let's say the thing that's higher up from us on the hierarchy we actually want to worship the thing that's the lowest on the hierarchy we really have a revolutionary a revolutionary way because to to worship money is to worship the lowest thing it's a worship potentiality itself and and that all well, why of would that, that be the lowest thing because it's like it's potentiality because it's you're basically worshiping potential like you're but isn't worshiping. That what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be going towards potential. You're supposed to. You you go towards potential, right? In order to be able to master it and then use it to serve the higher thing. The potentiality itself is not its potentiality. The it's distraction. Not, okay. It well, that's what, right, and that is what money is. It, that's right. how it corrupts. You get distracted yeah. by the money. You start worshiping the money rather than the proper goal. Let's say. Let's say. Yeah. Or you accept. You worship the money instead of worshiping the good things that you could do with money. But it, obviously, it's also a, those good things can also be become idols themselves. It's compli It's difficult, I imagine, when you have a lot of money. Let me just to follow up yeah, on one ahead. thing, though. So the worshiping the money is the worshiping potential is the lowest thing. And so that probably explains why it also is associated with corruption, because if you're just worshiping the potential, yeah. then you're, it's going to lead you astray. You're going to end up in a place that you don't want to be, most likely. Yeah, yeah because what's, gonna, what's also going to happen, and that's inevitable, is that there's going, to be, there's going to be an inevitable connection, let's say an inevitable connection between your own margin or your own peripheries and the social periphery that is money, let's say. And so if you worship money, then... What's going to happen almost inevitably is that you have, let's say, your sexual passions, your passions for prestige, your passions for, let's say, kind of risk taking and living, getting that kind of thrill. Those things are going to align themselves with the fact that you're worshiping with money because it's like there's an analogy between money, which is this potential on the edge, the idea of the foreign or whatever, and then your own passions on your own edge, which are your 
that all the passions that you can have. And so you'll worst, you'll try to find the best restaurant that serves something and you'll pay $500 for a dish because you want that experience that's, and you'll go out of your way to have this silly experience that's going to last 10 minutes, which there's nothing wrong with that experience. But if you start to live for those things, then you're in serious trouble. That's for sure. So the margins are where the passions reside. So you're trying to, your goal in life is to spend your life at the center and keep them right. at bay, correct? Or transform, like you you transform them. Because the passions, especially in the Christian understanding, the passions are not bad in themselves. The passions are, the passions, just like anything in a hierarchy, the passions in their proper place have a proper function. It's only when you get attached to a passion let's say. So for example, our passion for sexuality, there's actually nothing wrong with desiring sexuality. It's part of how the world continues to exist. And it's even an image of our relationship with God. The Bible, that there's connection between sexual union and the union of God with the soul, let's say. And so there's nothing wrong with that. But when you, let's say, if you plunge into that as its own purpose, that's when it becomes a problem. That's when it's going to be an idol, like we say. And the same for anything. Food is, there's nothing wrong with eating food. Even we eat communion is the highest mystery in the Christian tradition. It's actually eating food and drinking wine. And so it's the highest thing, but if, but it has to be aligned in the hierarchy. If food has a goal in itself, that's when it leads you either to become fat or to become a, a someone who looks for, who spends their time looking for the new pleasure or the new, the, this new sensation that they can get. And so that's, a, that, that's what, so it's not, it, you do want to live in the center, but the passions are not, it's important to see that the passions aren't evil. Like that, we're not Gnostics. We're not dualists. We want the passions to participate in this, in the fullness of experience. Is it possible to believe that you're outside the hierarchy? That you're, that you don't need it? That you're hmm. above that? That you well, can you transcend, can, yeah, you you can can transcend the yeah. hierarchy itself? Of course, you, that's... To think that's what the devil did. That's the first sin. The first sin is the sin of pride. And is to think right. it's to think that you yourself are the but if you think about all sins are the same. Like I talked about how the idea of let's say a passion, you see it as a goal in itself and as something that exists that has existence in itself. That's let's say the sin. But the first sin is to see yourself as that, to see yourself as having autonomous existence. And have and not being part of the natural order and the natural hierarchy of things, and that's the sin of Satan. It's the sin of Adam. It's the sin of. It's the, it's always the first sin is the sin of pride. There's actually a, an amazing quote I've quoted this a few times by Saint Maximus the Confessor, who talks about he calls them sins of the left hand and sins of the right hand. And right. The sins of the left hand are the passionate sins, and the right hand are the prideful sins. And he says the it always starts with the sin of the right hand. It's always the first sin, and then the left hand sins come in. Because once you start to think that you're autonomous and that you have self-sufficient, then inevitably you're going to start being led by your passions. And you'll think that's you, right? You'll think that's what I want. Like that, those are my desires. And I need to feed my desires because that's who I am. That's me. It's like people who think that they have this one desire and that desire is everything. It's their whole identity. It's their whole world. And if they can't satisfy that one desire, then... Like they cease to exist, basically. They think that they that their whole existence is in that desire. And that's definitely not that's definitely not a traditional way of seeing the world. Like you can't if you live that way, you're gonna you're going to become you're going to be in trouble psychologically. It's not it's gonna be inevitable. Jonathan, this has been great. You got a real gift for this. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope yeah, I hope it was useful. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and take a minute to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate it.